I got sent this book by someone, and they said, oh, yes. I, yeah. and they said I must read it. And I read it this morning. <laughs> yeah. And uh, well, I actually read part of it yesterday morning and part of it this morning. And in a way, this book by John Fowles, The Tree, epitomizes everything that this exhibition is about uh, uh, on life, environment, and people has been about. And just to pick one quote from this book, it, which in a, in a way to me just says it all, but all nature, like all humanity, is made up of minor exceptions, of entities that in some way, however dis scientifically disregardable, do not conform to the general rule. A belief in this kind of exception is as central to art as a belief in the utility of generalization is to science. Indeed, one might almost call art that branch of science, uh, art, that branch of science which presents, which present science is prevented by its old constricting tenets and philosophies from reaching. So essentially that's what this exhibition is about. Uh, it's, it's a, it's, the course itself is done uh, as a science course, but it is about essentially reaching those parts of, of, or those aspects of the world of nature, of our understanding, that current science cannot reach, and doing so artistically and doing so through the evocative qualities of the creative imagination. Um, and that is really the delight that I have year upon year upon year um, with these exhibitions of the students' work, because they are always full of minor exceptions. They are always utterly diverse, reflecting the individuality of every student and the individual creativity and imaginative flair of every student. And yet there's also a common theme, which if you really get to grips uh, and take in what they've done, you can, you can find that common theme, that commonality, which is underneath uh, this extraordinary diversity. And it is this sort of, this linkage between the commonality and the diversity uh, that I find utterly, Utter, utterly pleasing, really. Uh, there's no copying. There's no sort of, oh, I know, I, I, there's no formula. There is just, okay, I've been given a chance to express my understandings as best I can, and here we are. And that, I think, is terrific. And it kind of relates also to this comment I got back from one of this year's students. And I think I'll just read it, or read parts of it to you, because, again, it summarises what the intention behind this particular course has been for the last 11 years, this being its final year of presentation. The advantages of this module to the students who attended it are beyond describing for those who did not and have not attended it. In fact, it is exactly what I expected but never received from a university education until this module. It challenges the way you think begs that you broaden your horizons, opens your eyes to new ways of viewing the world and of being more in tune with what is happening in the world today while offering the best possible experience of a lecturer-led class I have ever had. This module challenges and does away with all the staid and repetitive approaches to learning and teaching which I and the majority of my friends have found to be commonplace and most disappointing throughout our time at Bath. Instead, taking a fresh and wholly worthwhile approach which not only engages the student in the idea, but lo and behold, actually attempts to involve us and value what we think and say, rather than encouraging us to hold no opinion other than that which can be backed up by those who have come before thus generating an unhealthy attitude towards learning by promulgating the advance of only that which is already thought. Such an approach kills fresh ideas, dulls our intellect, not sharpens, and devalues what we as young students have to offer, as well as devaluing us in ourselves. So it's very, very potent uh, 
sense of you know what an individual student feels about her own personal experience of being in a university course in our current academic system and the difference that she felt was brought uh, by what I've tried to do and, and what this course has tried to be and indeed saying what I've always felt you know this is what a university is supposed to be about isn't it uh, and which I've been personally most disappointed myself <laughs> in <laughs> discovering hasn't been what this university has been about. So again, I'm going to just, I wrote two poems yesterday, one of which sort of reflects the bitter experiences that I've had within this university and within my academic career, and another of which actually expresses the feelings that come uh, from viewing these displays. So I think it'd be quite nice, yeah, to just recite those two poems and they have exactly the same structure and the interesting thing is just to sort of note the difference in tonal quality between each of them. And both of them in their own way I think are important to appreciate and understand. They, they both have a story uh, which I think is important. So the first one, the first poem is called Teacher's Curse. There is a kind, there is a kind of insolence that delights in ignorance, declaring its state of independence from anything that is in your mind by denying admission to theirs. You try everything to find a way through that sullen stare of baleful blankness daring you to pitch your wits against its willful disregard. You dance, you sing, you do your thing, but still nothing gets taken in, and so you spin behind your grin, into your own recoil, all wound up whilst winding down, with eyebrows knitting into frown, afraid of all that lies within the wasteland of your travails. What can you do? when feeling so black and so blue, from flying into the face of utter denial, except force a smile, withdraw yourself from the pile of broken promise, heaped in sorry disarray at the bottom of the cliff, and take flight from fright, soaring be re beyond reach of insolent ignorance. So that's teacher's curse, and that's part of my experience as an educator uh, in this university. Teacher's joy, which is kind of related to the exhibition here. There is a kind of yearning that delights in opening out, accepting its needful readiness for that anything that is in your mind to come to life in theirs. You allow every possibility for entrance through that open pupil of wide-eyed receptivity that welcomes your wits within its willing regard. You dance, you sing, you do your thing, and still no thing gets taken in within the spin of their broad grin, delighting in recollection, all winding up whilst winding loose, with eyebrows curling into their own true story, aware of all that lies within the wonderland of your travails. What cannot be done when feeling such currents of shade and light by flying from the face of utter denial without the need to force a smile, Lifting yourself from the whole of hidebound promise, flocked in sundry disarray beyond the cliff, where flight takes fright, dipping beyond the reach or beneath the reach of overruling might. So, two utterly different experiences, and I think they sort of inform a great deal. If we take those two experiences together, each in their own way has something important to say about our current educational practice um, and the difference, if you like, between an educational practice that releases uh, creativity and an educational practice that stifles it. So, in a way, those, 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 um, that, that says quite a lot about why, why <laughs> why I've, uh, I've, I appreciate what the students have done in this particular exhibition mm -hmm. as just a part of their coursework. It only counts for 20% of the mark, 
yet you can see almost immediately the extraordinary effort and energy so many have put into it, way beyond what they needed to do in many cases, you know, for the sake of getting marks to, yeah, to, yeah. to, to qualify for something, but much more to do with their own sense of pleasure uh, in looking into themselves and, talk, and, and expressing themselves in a way that they feel they want to. Yeah. And that's what it's about. Would you like just to move us through the exhibition? Yes, well, we, exhibition? Can, we, can, we can take a few, a, a look at some yeah. particular examples, perhaps. Uh, just uh, which are, which, some of which are very striking uh, and almost immediately obvious. Uh, others of which are not so obvious, and, and, and they required me to do work to understand them, to appreciate them. But in that requirement for me, the observer, to do work to understand what lay behind their surface, yeah, there's, there's actually, again, a lot of creativity uh, in that. So, I mean, we could start with this one, which is, in a way, very immediately and strikingly obvious as a kind of re immediate reflection on a sense of tunnel vision analytical science um, and, the, the, and the sense that that imposition of false definitive frameworks upon the world and upon nature essentially locks the heart away uh, behind the coldness of the objective scientist who can only see in this very tunnel visioned blinkered way. Uh, and the student obviously feels extremely strongly about this. <laughs> and to put such an enormous amount of effort into producing a piece of work like this, with, with incredible symbolism actually, the symbolism of the fluid flow out beyond the, that is excommunicated from the throne, the emergent, uh, the emergent phoenix, and then within the throne, the barbed wired heart the, 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 only the left hemisphere of the brain present, <laughs> the, only the analytical side, and the sort of grimness <laughs> of, of the expression uh, of the entrapped analytical mind, purely analytical mind that needs so much yeah, to be, break beyond the confines of the imposed frame. So that's a, 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 also a very, very obvious, uh, in many ways, piece of work, very, very striking. I suppose I can't, I can't avoid <laughs> noticing this one for its sheer size. <laughs> but again, the vibrancy of this piece of work was, and, and I know the student involved, ex because she told me so, she experienced, she, she said that when she started the course she knew it would be different. And then she said that what I didn't realise is that I would be different after it. And this painting expresses that difference that she felt in the release of her inner tensions, inner confinements, from those kinds of confinements, if you like, uh, just into this extraordinary uh, dynamic expression uh, of her, her, her own feelings about herself, which she, she told me was also associated with the experience, for the first time in her life, of deep inner calm, which, again, so a very moving <laughs> in many ways, kind of, 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 of portrayal. This one's an example of one which is not so immediately obvious in terms of what it's trying to say. That as you, and you think, what have we got here? We've got some loopy wire with, 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 with the spheres that move along the wire. Uh, it's within a wooden frame, a sort of constructed wooden frame. Um, the pink bits, black bits, white bits on, on this frame. What exactly is this trying, trying to say? But as we just take a look uh, at what it's trying to say, I'll actually, whoops, I think I might have facilitate this to the paper. <laughs> That's all right. Okay, this is what she says. This abacus represents the flow of space within us and for me was a way to conceptualize what I learned about receptive transfigural space from the Life, Environment and People course. 
The wire represents the space along which our lives are lived and travelled, that which holds us up, supports us and gives us form. It moves through us, as the wire shows by moving through the beads, that the beads have a receptive space in their centre along where their configuration represents the space within us and the frame which supports the abacus is white to show that it too is a point of space, not a defining abstraction. Okay, real depth of understanding uh, behind uh, this piece of work and taking actually this ancient method of calculation which some say is faster than some you know people can use ab an abacus faster than a computer uh, when they get really used to it is actually making use of this slipperiness yes <laughs> along which you move the um, and move the counters and you actually with the abacus have a, a, a very different notion of the idea of numbers numbers are now seen to be travelers Yes, <laughs> and, and to include space through their heart, to include the zero within themselves, which is actually the basis of a form of mathematics invented by Leray Shikandli called transfigural mathematics. And she, this student, has clearly picked that up uh, and, and got this sense of the object no longer as discrete from space or contained in space or surrounded by space, but the object as a point of, in, you know, as an included point of space, yeah? a suspension, if you like, an animation, yeah? a suspended animation in space. And she described the experience to me of now looking at all objects and seeing straight through them as if they were hovering. Yeah? And that, that again, is, is a delightful example of an inclusion of experience of the world and translated yeah, into, a, in a very creative way, into a representation. So, uh, a very nice piece of work uh, in that regard. This piece of work too, this is, this is an interesting piece of work here, it took me ages to work this one out. But what, what do we have here? We have, uh, we have a mirrored surface with a, with a black border, the, num the student has written his name as a number, <laughs> so, so I had to work out what his identity was from his, from his exam number. Uh, we've got bits and pieces of broken rulers, protractors, set squares, and then we've got a light bulb, and it says on the top of this globe here, you can lift me. So it's inviting you, yeah, to lift you, to lift. And we can indeed lift up the bowl, breaking the constraints of the protractors, rulers, yes, and all the rest, and actually seeing the fingerprints on the bowl which signify the unique identity of this student. And it's in a, in a, in a way it's a form of self-reflection which illustrates yeah, that the release yeah, of the student's own awareness of their self-identity. Yeah? and how that translates into the light bulb of creativity. Extraordinary piece of work, and, and, and very, very deep. And, but in this particular case, no explanation, you have to work it out. And that's a challenge, that's difficult, that's, al that's always tricky. You know? do, do, you, do you tell your, your observer what this is about, or do you allow them to try and work it out? He took a risk, and in my view he succeeded quite powerfully although I've noticed that a lot, a, lot of, a lot of people walk by this display and don't notice this piece of work yeah, which is kind of interesting too and a piece of work which in a way is just as conceptually strong that people notice very quickly <laughs> is this one <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I, I almost don't have to say anything about this. It is so obvious uh, what this student is saying about the constraints of, uh, of imposing a time frame on the continuum, the continuum of our lives. And this, I think, is in many ways. I could see that. I could see that in Tate Modern quite easily. Behind you here is is another piece which is quite interesting. Provide it with strings attached so that I would have to suspend this piece of work. 
but we actually can see on the front here the rather elaborate and rather beautifully uh, drawn gateway, uh, an, a portal if you like, uh, with, which is perforated, you can see through it from one side to the other, so it's a perforated portal with, with, with natural ivy forms growing around it, a, a great deal of colour uh, associated with it. Um, and in itself, a, a really quite skillful uh, piece of artwork. But you have to look behind it too. Because you can see on the other side <laughs> is the closed door <laughs> that blocks yeah, the vista, the blocks the view, yeah, and is isolated with confinement. Yeah, uh, again, that, just like in the very first one we looked at, an, an indication of a sense of confinement that comes from a purely analytical approach uh, to understanding the natural world. There's nothing wrong with the analytical approach in itself. The problem is when it's the only approach. And a lot of the students really, I think, bring that out very clearly, that they appreciate the, 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 the benefits, the strengths of the analytical approach. It's perfectly okay in its own right. The big problem is when it becomes the only approach. And then when, when that happens, then our sense of our own sense of human belonging in the natural world disappears and we become alienated. And that alienation, that sense of mental alienation from nature is a recurrent theme of our modern culture uh, that the students picked up from the course and that they feel quite obviously we have to get past that sense of putting a barrier yeah, between what is within ourselves and what is up with our, outside ourselves and to recognise that actually space is continuous between the inner world and the outer world. And so the very idea of us as discrete subjects and objects doesn't work and is not realistic. Yet it is the source and heart of so much human conflict and distress. So getting past that space barrier, which is imposed by the objectivist frame, is something which is deeply important and which in that, if you like, is the common theme that you can actually see repeated again and again in almost every piece of work that there is here, the need to break through the space barrier. That's great. Yep. Okay, I'll just go and. Yeah. This is like fun with the holy, holy holiness in the painting. The cut, 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 yes, to show the space present. Yeah. And the divide between the natural and the artifice. They, ex you know, have got explanations. Some of them haven't. So that one of the, of the globe, for example, there's no explanation. You're just left to work it out. But in the essays that they wrote, you know, which are the f more formal part that I do, which has to be there to satisfy, you know, the powers that be, uh, it's quite interesting. I mean, they were very good overall, the essays, and I gave a lot of first-class marks. But most of them actually. Uh, in the written form lose the sense of inclusionality that you can see instantaneously <laughs> yeah, in so much of their actual artwork. So the artwork actually allows the expression yeah, of, of, of the natural inclusionality that the writing in some way irons out or, or, or rules out. A lot of them had a great deal of difficulty really expressing themselves, you know, in, in the formal written way, 
Um, whereas the artwork itself, you know, said it was. They didn't, they didn't use the artwork. 